you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We are walking through the book of Romans, uh, verse by verse and line by line. And last week, we showed you the gospel. The, the first part, the first 13 verses in Romans chapter 10 is the gospel. And, uh, and we found out in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is for everyone, but not everyone chooses to be saved. And this, this is part of what we will be talking about in our second part of uh, Romans chapter 10. If you have a bulletin and want to follow us in uh, the outline, number one, sharing the gospel. I want to talk to you today about sharing the gospel. Number one, the call to the gospel. All right, Jesus himself called you to salvation. The Holy Spirit called you to salvation, but he also calls you to share the gospel. Number two, the rejection of the gospel. The rejection of the gospel. And number three, the testimony of the prophets. The testimony of the prophets. You know, I think everyone here believes that the gospel is the greatest gift ever known to mankind. Someone had to share scripture with you in order for you to be saved. Aren't you glad someone took the time to share with you and to lead you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord? We have something extremely powerful that can totally change a person's life and their eternal destiny, yet we find it hard sometimes to share this good, good news to people we know and love. My friend, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming soon. And if we're going to do something for God and Jesus, we must do it now. The Apostle Paul shares his burden for lost people in our text today. My prayer is that we will have the same burden for lost people around us. Let's look at Paul's uh, four questions in our text that he uh, tells us that we all need to be sharing the gospel. Romans chapter 10. Verse 14, he throws out four rhetorical questions, four questions in this first part. The call to the gospel, how then shall we call on him whom they have not believed? Folks, you have to know, you have to know something before you can call on someone there are still people in our world that do not know Jesus Christ. I know that's hard for us to comprehend in our minds because we all have multiple Bibles at our house. You can turn on the TV anytime, any day, and you can see the gospel. But there are still people that do not know about Jesus Christ and who he was and what he had done. How, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Oh, folks, there are still third world countries. There are still places in the world that have not heard a pure gospel. You say, Mike, how do you know that? Because if everyone has heard it, then folks, Jesus would come. He gives everyone an opportunity to be saved. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Folks, a preacher is like a herald. A preacher says, thus saith the Lord. And I don't know how many sermons you've sat under. I'm 64 years old and I've been in church most of my life, all but two years. And I could not tell you how many sermons I have sat under. I have been here 18 and a half years, and I couldn't even tell you how many sermons I've preached in that 18 and a half years. So it, it's not us. It's not us saying, what are you talking about? We know the gospel. We know the importance of the gospel. We understand that people need the gospel. There are people in our areas or in our lives or in our families or in our workplaces that need Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But somehow our lips tend to be sealed about that. We can talk about ball games. I mean, last night, uh, you know, you know, or Friday night when the football games, you could tell, you could tell me a lot of things that went, went on there. 
And while that is fine, talking to people about life is fine, but the most important thing you can talk to people about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? I think of Bakri today over in Africa. You, you just, just I, I can see him walking the streets. He took 200 water purifiers with him. And folks, he is sharing the gospel. And I ask you to pray for Bakari every day. We were a part of that. We were a part of, of his ministry when we gave to his ministry. And then it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are their feet. Now I will say, and I'm testifying, feet are not beautiful, okay? I don't want to see your feet. I'm not going to show you my feet, okay? That's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying the ministry that you do with your feet, your feet on the ground, sharing with others, that ministry is beautiful. Folks, there's no greater feeling to a person that was lost knowing he was bound for hell and realizing God just saved me. You go back to your own conversion experience and you think about the day you got saved. Folks, I am telling you, it was the greatest day of your life because the gospel uh, seals us with God and Jesus forever and ever and ever. No one can take your salvation experience from you. So the greatest day that ever happened in our life, we somehow don't seem to see the need to share those things with others. And Jesus and, and God through here is saying, man, you want beautiful feet? You get in the gospel field. You share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Hold your finger there. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1. Jesus was about to ascend. This is one of the last things he told his disciples. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When do you receive that power? When you get saved. The Holy Spirit comes into your life at that point. The Holy Spirit changes you. God the Father who created you, God the Son who died for you, and God the Holy Spirit, when you truly get saved, it is inside of you. So you are not alone. Folks, anytime you share the gospel, you got three people as your cheerleaders. God's saying, go get them. Jesus is saying, man, I died for them. And the Holy Spirit is simply saying, just share your testimony. And when you share your testimony about what God has done, share the gospel. Folks, one of the easiest ways, and I still do this, I've been trained in four different types of evangelism. And I find myself still, Scott, going back to the Roman road. I learned that when I was six or seven years old. Folks, it is the easiest way to share the gospel with someone. That's what it's saying. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Shall doesn't mean it's an option. It means it's a command. God is telling us we as Christians need to share our testimony and the gospel with others. And then he gives you a list to me. You shall be witnesses to me. We are God's spokesperson. We are Jesus' hands and his eyes and his feet. We are uh, filled with the Holy Spirit as we go. And then he gives you Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Folks, the neat thing about what's going on in our world, and I understand about illegal aliens. I, I understand that. People that come in here like that. But there are many of them that come in here the right way, folks. And what God is doing is bringing the world to us. 
Scott shared with us this week, how many new uh, international students? 15 international students at UFAS today just came in. And I'm telling you, the BCM and that ministry and the Conversation Club will somewhere share the gospel with them. We don't have to pay $4,000 to fly across the world. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. If God tells you to go, you go. Matter of fact, there are in my plans, plans to go to Africa. That is on my bucket list. And one day I'm going to get there, okay? And, you know, I, I just want to get there. I want to see. I want to uh, see a, a culture that I've never seen. I want to be able to give my testimony and to preach through an interpreter. And that's what he's saying. We have all been commanded. But you know where you start? You start at home. You start at your house. Then you go to your neighbors. Then you go to your friends and your circles. And you just keep going out from there. This is Jesus commissioning his disciples. Then in Matthew Matthew 28, and we know this is the Great Commission. We know this. We've known it all our lives. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Jesus is telling his disciples. This is another, some, some more of his last words on earth. And folks, the last words of people are important. And here's what he's saying. I, I spent three and a half years for, with you for a purpose. I'm going. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going back to my father's house. And I am commissioning you. You, you 12 or you 11, you are going out and you are going to take the gospel to all the world. Go. Notice the word 19. Go. And we sometimes as Baptists all our lives we want to sit, soak, and sour. I'm serious. I love our worship service. They are spirit-filled. God speaks to us. God is moving. But somewhere we have to get out of our seats and out into our Jerusalem. Folks, our Jerusalem is Fort Smith. Our Jerusalem is our neighborhood. And it says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Folks, I know baptism doesn't save you, but you know what baptism is? It is a testimony. It is the first testimony that you give. You are telling everyone out here, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know that I'm a Christian. And especially in those days, because they were baptized in rivers and in creeks and in public. You see, I wish during the baptismal service somehow we could get a big glass back here and anybody that was going by there could see our baptismal service and see what's going on in God's church. It's a public, public profession of faith and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. What did Jesus say first? Jesus first said, hey, listen, I am commissioning you to do this. The second thing he said was, I'm here to help you do this. Folks, we're never alone. And it's not our responsibility to save people. Matter of fact, I've never saved a person in my life. Never have. And you haven't either. It is God that saves. It is the Holy Spirit that pulls at their heart. Our job is to share. Because folks, it takes two things to be saved. One, somebody has to share the gospel. Somebody has to give the scripture. The Gideon Bible. Get you a Gideon Bible. Lonnie, Lonnie, we got them. We got plenty of them. We have the little New Testament that has the Roman road in it. You have to have Scripture for someone to be saved. And the second thing you have is the Holy Spirit. And folks, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to simply share the gospel. And what happens is up to God. 
You can't fail in this. You'll never be a failure in this. But we need to understand that we personally as Christians have a call to the gospel. Now back in our scripture, look at Romans. How beautiful are the feet, we said, who bring glad tidings. Oh, folks, everybody likes good news. Everybody likes good news. And you know what the good news today is? Two words, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Now the second thing I want you to see is the rejection of the gospel. And this is where we have a hang up. We are afraid we're going to be rejected. And what you have to realize is, folks, they are not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. It's God they're rejecting. And that is not your fault. Okay? I wished everyone that I've ever shared with would make a profession of faith to Christ. But I will tell you from experience, I've had a whole lot more not be saved than saved. That is the job of the Holy Spirit and God. Now look at verse 16. Paul says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Even though they've heard it, they have not said yes to the gospel. Folks, there are many people that have rejected the gospel. There are many people that when they hear, and, and I've seen them, I've been in revival services. I remember one time I was in the pew and I was looking at a guy and then they were pews back where we were. And he, his knuckles, he was hanging onto this pew and tears were rolling down his eyes. And I saw a man go over to him and say, can I go down front with you? And he said, no, just leave me alone. And I thought, you talk about someone under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but yet he did not go down. And what Paul is talking about more than anything here, not just lost people, he's talking about Israel. Israel had the Old Testament. Israel had the prophets. Paul uh, here is saying and, and, and showing all that God did to prove himself to who he was and what we, he was about. And we'll see here in just a minute in Psalms where they couldn't, they couldn't say they don't know because the Scriptures give a story of Jesus' life 700 years before he was even born. So folks, we are all responsible for the gospel, but there are people that reject it. They just reject the gospel. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Folks, you have to believe. There are a lot of people that don't believe. I've run into several that said, well, I don't believe in God. Well, I got news for you, folks. That person's not going to be saved. You've got to believe not in a God, but a God of this universe, a God of this Bible. Belief and faith is so important. Then he says in verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is our job? To open our mouths and share the gospel. That is our job. They have to hear it first and then they can believe even though many, many of them did not believe the gospel Look in Matthew chapter 7. Go with me to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verse 13. This is Jesus' words. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Folks, there's only two gates. Okay, there's only two gates. There's the gate of life, and there is the gate of death. The narrow way, the narrow way. Uh, enter by the, the narrow gate, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Folks, I'm telling you, we have to decide. We have to choose. We have to believe. And you understand what gates purposes are. Narrow means there's not a whole lot of folks that's going to go through that gate. 
But when you see a broad gate, when you see a wide gate, it means a lot of people are going. Folks, there have been a lot of people throughout history that have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. It will lead to destruction. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Oh, listen to me, folks. The narrow way is God's way. The narrow gate is God's gate. The narrow way is the way to heaven. And it's not easy. Being a Christian is not easy. It's a whole lot easier to be a lost person than a Christian. And then he says, enter into the narrow gate. It's difficult. It leads to life. And there are few that find it. Then skip down to verse 21. 21. And he's talking about false professions of faith here. Just because you have prayed a prayer doesn't mean you're going to heaven. God knows your motive. God knows why you prayed that prayer. God knows, and folks, for many, it was just fire insurance. I did that when I was five years old. A guy preached on hell. I was five years old. I went down front, and I just didn't want to go to hell. But I knew nothing about the gospel. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Folks, it's not a, a thing of religion, okay? It's a thing of righteousness. Do you have the righteousness of God in your life? Do you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Were you sincere when you prayed? Was there a change in you when you prayed, or have you just gone back and you're doing the same thing you used to do when you were younger? I am telling you, salvation, true salvation, brings change in a person. And then look at this, verse 23. I, I believe it's one of the saddest scriptures in all the Word of God. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Folks, I am telling you, there are going to be some people when they stand before God, and they're going to be surprised. God's going to look at them and say, oh, I know you got baptized. I know you went to church. I know you've done that. But I do not know you. Folks, we are known by our fruits. What fruit do we have? What fruit? And I understand there are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are good. That is great to have those fruits in your life. But it's also souls. It's also sharing the gospel with others. And so we need to understand Israel rejected God. People reject God all the time. But it is the absolute worst decision you make in your life. So we see the call to the gospel. We see the rejection of the gospel. And then the last thing, let's look at the testimony of the prophets. Verse 18, but I say, you know, I, I've said this before in the book of Romans, Paul was so smart. He would take Old Testament scripture that they, the scribes and the Pharisees, had to memorize, and he would use them against them. Folks, anybody can memorize Scripture. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to memorize Scripture. Now, for us that are getting older, <laughs> it's a challenge to memorize Scripture. All right? I don't remember what I had for breakfast today sometimes. All right? But anybody can memorize Scripture. Look what it says. But I say, have they not heard? Nobody in this world will leave it and say, I've never heard about God. There's two things. There is the general revelation of God. Okay? That is somewhere along life, God has sent somebody your way and shared a scripture, and you just ignored that scripture. But also, uh, there is a, uh, a nature part of revelation. Psalms 14 says what? Go outside and look at the stars. Think about orbit. We're on earth. 
and it is rotating around the sun. God has shown himself through nature. There's nobody that can say, man, I, I've never seen God. You just have never acknowledged the God that you have already seen. And you know what? We think we're crazy. We think that if we just ignore it, it'll go away. We think if we ignore it, it's not going to happen. And folks, it's kind of like bad news. All right, we, we tend to ignore bad news, but somewhere we got to face it up and we got to realize, hey, I, this is the way it is and I need to deal with this. And so these revelations, God is not going to send someone to hell and he has never sent someone to hell anyway. Okay, he's always given them the freedom of choice that has never had a revelation of some kind from God. Now look what it says. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. The sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. Psalms 19.4 is what he is quoting here. So we can see God in creation. We can see God, and, and I really don't understand the Big Bang Theory. You're going to believe that somewhere out there, two Two rocks hit each other and poof, earth happened. Folks, I believe in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 19, but I say, didn't Israel not know? First, Moses said, okay, David wrote the Psalms, and he, we, we know he was a prophet of God. Moses wrote, and he wrote this, listen to this, 1,500 years before it happened. 1,500 years Moses wrote this, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And what did the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees despise? He despised, they despised the Gentiles. And what did Paul say? Paul said, hey, if the Jews and them, if they uh, you know, uh, reject me, I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. Uh, folks, there's Gentiles all around us. There's lost people all around us. In God's gospel, I'm telling you, he hasn't left Israel, but there's a definite pause right now. And he, he hasn't forgotten them. He hasn't rejected them. But there is a pause right now, and I'm telling you, people all over the world are getting saved. Gentiles all over the world are getting saved. Then verse 20, but Isaiah is very bold saying, another one of the prophets, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Folks, the Gentiles, they did not have, most of them, a copy of the Old Testament. They didn't go to the synagogues because they were rejected. They were not welcomed in a Jewish synagogue. But even in their ignorance and now not having knowledge of the Word of God, God saves them. God sends someone to them to share the gospel with them. And that's what he's saying. None of us, if you live in America, you have no excuse. No excuse. The gospel is everywhere. In verse 21, but to Israel he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and to a contrary people. Man, God gave the children of Israel every chance in the world to repent. Every chance in the world. We don't have time to go there, but Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Well, we're going to go there anyway. Hold on. <laughs> the Holy Spirit told me to go. Who has believed our report? Isaiah 53. And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a lot to look at. But I am telling you, folks, it was talking about Jesus growing up. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid our faces as if it was from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Folks, he died 
on the cross for you. That is the gospel. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. We were there. Our sin was there. It was at the cross, folks. He bore our sin. In the only way, there are people here today that cannot find peace. And the reason you can't find peace is because you don't know the Prince of Peace. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Folks, the greatest gift, the greatest gift you could give anyone, it's not in a package, folks. You don't buy it at a store. You don't wrap it. You share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Why? Because it's a gift that will last for all eternity. I jotted down five reasons we need to be sharing the gospel, and I close with this. Number one, it's a command from above. We already showed you Acts chapter 1-8. Number two, it's a cry from beneath. Remember the rich man? Go tell my brothers that they don't want to come here. They don't want to come here. Number three, it's the call of the nations. There are nations calling us. You're Americans. You have everything. Come share the gospel with us. Number four, it's the constraint from within. That is the love of Christ. The love of Christ should help us and make us want to share the gospel. In the last one, the coming of the Lord. Folks, he's coming soon. And we need to take as many people with us as we, we possibly can. Father, thank you for this day. And God, thank you for the gospel. God, thank you that you gave me three chances at it. Lord, I rejected it twice. And God, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know you, God, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that you would just give them the courage to come down and just simply say, I need to be saved. I need the gospel in my life. And Lord, I pray for Christians today. God, I pray. I know it's hard, but God, you have told us sharing the gospel is a command. And God, I pray that even some Christians would hit this altar today. And I pray that they would have a name in mind. And God, I pray that they would just pray for that person and in the next week or two, they would purposely share the gospel with that person. God, the angels in heaven would be rejoicing. They would be rejoicing over one sinner that comes to Christ. And God, those may, others may need to rededicate their life or uh, come for baptism or come for church membership. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. We give it to you. We love you. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.